the Linux operating system is uh, it's, it was derived from a, um, a Unix operating system. Um, so I just want to go over like a little bit of the history of of Linux. Um, so back in the 1960s, actually it might even make sense to go a little bit before uh, the 1960s. In the 50s, IBM was making mainframe operate, uh, mainframe computers that had um, large operating systems, uh, and then a combination of uh, people from MIT, uh, Bell Laboratories here in New Jersey, and General Electric jointly got together and made an operating system called Multex. And I think this word is coming from uh, multiple users, multiple address spaces, and then like text, like techniques, techniques for multiple users and multiple address spaces. And it was a fairly complicated operating system, much like the ones IBM was making at the same time. In the 1970s, some people from Bell Laboratories wanted to create an operating system that wasn't meant to have you know, so many processes running at once and so many virtual address spaces running at once, but it would be more geared towards you know, either one person using the computer or a small group of people, and decided instead of it being like a multi-technique, techniques for running multiple processes, they wanted it to be one process, uh, one or a very small number of processes, so they decided to call it Unix, U-N-I-C-X. So Uni being one, and Nix on the end being, you know, meaning these are the techniques for doing that. And then Bell Labs later changed the name to Unix, which is kind of the way it was being pronounced, but changed its name to Unix. And then in the 1980s when AT&T, which is the company does anyone know what AT&T stands for? The letters A, T, the first T and the last T? No? Okay, so it's American Telephone and Telegraph. So I don't know if you guys have ever even know what a telegraph is, but that was even like before my time. But anyway, um, AT&T was the only company in the United States that provided telephone service. And its research arm was Bell Laboratories, which was almost all located in New Jersey. Some of it was in Colorado, but uh, most of it was in New Jersey. And the guy who does the Dilbert cartoons, I don't know if you saw those, he worked for uh, Bell Labs in Colorado. <coughs> so all his, all his jokes are about like, working at Bell Labs. But um, anyway, when, when in 1984, when the government sued AT&T because it was a monopoly, the only company that was offering telephone service in the country, split it up, and this operating system, Unix, which was owned by AT&T at the time, part of that government you know, lawsuit against the company said that they couldn't market Unix as their own product, they couldn't sell it. So it's not like, you know, Windows is owned by Microsoft, and, and Microsoft can sell Windows, and nobody else can copy it. Unix became an operating system that Bell Laboratories wasn't allowed to say, we're the owner of, we'd like to sell it, so it became free, and it became legal to copy it. So then the University of California at Berkeley made a free copy of it, and Hewlett Packard made a free copy of it. And then uh, the operating system, which was really, it's, from its original name, it was meant to be a simple operating system. It got pretty complicated, too. And then a, uh, a I think from Finland, that was a uh, graduate student, his first name is Linus, came up with a much, supposedly, a much, much simpler version of, of Linux and it's, I'm sorry, a much simpler version of Unix, which he ended up calling Linux, which kind of comes from Linus's Unix. Ended up being called Linux. Um, and it's supposed to be a scaled down version of uh, the Unix operating system. And like I say, they're all, since, since the, the design of it is something that uh, Bell Laboratories couldn't say they were the owner of, it becomes you know, legal to copy it, copy the design of it. So basically, the layers to it is like the user space, the kernel space, which is the operating system itself, and then the operating system talking to its hardware. The overall design of it is application programs, which is what we would be end up writing. We would write these programs, compile them, and run them on the system. And then also services, which we talked about was like we could run services like Telnet, and um, web services off of that. 
and that ends up being processes that run, go back to sleep, ask if there are any work to do, start running again. And so those would be services that we'd end up, we could run on the Linux operating system. So the applications and the services keep making system calls. So our system call layer is the layer where, like our P and our V function, if you want to ask, is this resource available, you make a call to the operating system, and then that runs in kernel mode. And then it replies to you, yes, it's available, no, it's not available. And then if that code needed to move process control blocks around, um, it can access the, uh, the memory manager, it can access our virtual file system, so it could do the virtual address translation, so it could figure out where, uh, where the next instruction is to be run from. We could do process management, which is where we're man manipulating the queues to take a process that's on the ready queue, move it over to a queue waiting for a semaphore or printer to be, you know, become available. Um, the process manager could talk, could you use uh, the IPC, the inter-process communication, to have processes give storage or information to other processes. Um, so, and this could be done using shared storage, like we talked about, or using pipes. Two different ways we could do that. The virtual uh, file system communicates with the physical file system, and the physical file system is where, in memory, we have like locations on the disk drive where files are. If we know the exact location of where a file is, we could go to the I.O. interface, which could then talk directly to the hardware, like disk drives, or any type of hardware on a system. Um, so this is kind of just the layers of the Linux architecture. And then uh, Linux allows multi-threaded processing. So the state changes to our, I mean, every, pretty much every thread, multi-threaded operating system will have states that go something like this. But we end up being in a creation phase, so that's where the threads uh, data about the thread is being created. Once it becomes, um, once it's considered to be created, it moves into a state that they call active. So you might think, wh what does it really matter what we name these states, right? Because what does it mean to be, what we talk about in our text, in, in our class, is we say you're in the ready state. So that means you're not on the process of running, but you are not waiting for anything. So if we put you on the processor, you could run. We always call that the ready state. Here we call it the active state. But if we ever do like a dump of the storage, the Linux operating system will print out the state of every process at the time some error occurred, and it will print out these names. So it's you know kind of important to know the names that they happen to use. So active, a thread that is considered active in Linux is what we've been calling ready. So active means uh, you're not running, but you are in a position to run. So if the operating system moves that process from the what we're calling the ready queue, or what they call the active state, if the operating system dispatches it and puts it on the computer, on the processor, it starts running. So it could be in the running state, and then if its time expires, um, it could it could end up expiring. Uh, it can end up expiring because it needs to interact with another process, or it could end up expiring just because it ran out of time and moves to the expired state. In either case, it will eventually go back to what we've been calling the ready queue, which they call the active state. At a time when you're running, there's two ways you could stop. One would be if if you put if the process puts itself to sleep, which we did in our first project. We intentionally put ourselves to sleep by using the Unix sleep command, or dependent. We did in Java. So in Java has, uh, in its programming language, you could put something to sleep, which would then move the thread into, if, if it's running on Linux, we'll move it into the sleeping state. If it's running on Windows, it'll be done slightly different, but the programming language is still the same. We end up saying sleep for a certain amount of time. While we're in the sleep state, our process is sitting on a queue waiting, but the operating system has a thread that's watching the clock, and when the clock, the system clock says the time you want it to be asleep has expired, it will move you back to the active state. We could also ask for a resource. This is by signaling. Our code could ask for a resource that's not available. And that would mean we went through system code, asked for a resource that wasn't there, so we end up being moved to a block state 
and were considered to be stopped. What this really means compared to what we've been talking about in class is that um, our process or our thread has been moved onto a queue that's waiting for something else to signal us to get off the queue. And then eventually we get a, what, what Linux calls a continue signal, which uh, depending on what programming language you we use, we want to call, you know, Dijkstra's V function, whatever it ends up being called, will that also move us back to the active state? And the active state means we are now ready to start running again. And then we also have the case, this is a common thing for all Unix, all flavors of Unix, you run to a point where you're finished, and when you finish, you go into what's called the zombie state. And the zombie state means we're done, there's no more processing to do, but there's information about our process that needs to still be around, like maybe files we have have access to, the operating system wants to free that up, or any resources that we're still hanging on to that maybe we shouldn't hang on to, uh, the operating system would want to clean that up before it actually goes and deletes our storage. Once it deletes our storage, it can't trace what we had or what we need to give back to the operating system. So th this diagram, th these names only really have matter if uh, you have, you know, some incident comes up and you need to uh, figure out what state the system was in when the, the dump of the storage was taken. These uh, names might actually be used because those are the official Linux names for the states. Uh, okay, so pretty much every example we've gone over in this class, we always assume that when you run what we call the ready queue, meaning you're waiting to get on the processor so you can continue running. It was always implied that the queue was first come, first serve. So you get you get on in a certain order, you run for a while, and then you go to the back of the queue. And then you work your way up to the front, and then you might ask for a resource that's not there, you get put on a waiting queue. And then I think in the example we went over in class, when you get put back on the queue, you get put to the front. So we're kind of doing that because it's easy for us to follow. The way Linux does this, and remember, it's kind of interesting, Linux wanted to be much simpler than other operating systems that are out there. Linux has a run queue which has negative 20 to positive 19, has 40, a linked list of 40 pointers. And what these are is the priority of your process. So when you enter the system, you're assigned a process priority of zero. And you can go, you could gain priority and you could lose priority. So you start at zero and then you could go positive or you could go negative. And there's tw negative 20 priority buckets and positive 19 priority buckets. And you have the ability to hop around from one to the other. These are pointers now which have a linked list of processes on each one of those levels. So for example, if you went to the system at priority zero, and maybe the operating system isn't giving you enough page frames for you to run at a certain speed and the operating system feels you've been in the system too long, it'd like to help you speed up. It could actually increase your priority to get you out the door quicker. If for some reason your process is eating up too many resources or takes resources and hangs on for them too long, it might lower your priority at a time when you don't have too many resources at the moment. So then the operating system comes to the ready queue to pick the next one to run. Let's say one process has run for a while and its time has expired. We want to go to the ready queue to pick the next one. And what we end up doing is we go through like the highest priority ones and each give, give those each a higher time quantum. Then the next lower one go through those with less time and then we work our way down to the end and give very, very little time to these ones. So it has a, it's not that the time quantums for everything in the ready queue are exactly the same. There are big quantums and little quantums depending on what your priority is. And what we don't want to do is have a starvation by having everything at the front always get serviced and the only way we get down to minus 20 is if all of the stuff before it is done. So we are working our way from the top to the bottom of the queue, but we're giving a higher priority to the higher priority number processes. So it's pretty complicated. <laughs> there's, a, there's a lot of uh, processing going on just moving around this queue while the actual processes are run. Okay, and then in our virtual addressing um, example, if you remember in class, we, talk, we gave one example where we had a page number and an offset into a page. 
And then we kind of talked about this segmented paging system where we took your program, broke it up into a set of what we called segments. And does anybody remember the, the fundamental difference between a page and a segment? Or by definition, what is a page? Or a page has a property about it that a segment wouldn't have. And kind of having the ability to do both could be helpful in an operating system. So a page is a, yeah? Yeah, but a page is always considered, just remember this when you go on a job interview, a page is always considered, to, pages are considered to be all the same size. And a segment could be chunks based on the logic of your design. So when we talked about a two-level page system, we had a segment followed by a page number followed by an offset. And the idea was it might logically make sense for chunks of your program to be grouped together. And then once they're grouped together, we can break those into page tables. What Linux does is has three levels to it. So it has, uh, their names were the global, the global, they don't call it a segment, but the global chunk, I'll say. Then the middle chunk, and then the page table, and then the offset into the page table. So the way we do virtual addressing on Linux is your virtual address gets moved into a global chunk. So that's a one table that where we can find every process that's in our system. From that global chunk, we get a pointer to a middle directory of pages. And then the bits for our middle section tell us where the middle, that this would end up being an address of a particular page table. And then that offset times this far into the page table tells us how far to go into the page table for that middle section. And then the middle section will eventually tell us the page frame in real memory. And as always, the displacement gets copied bit for bit. So as much as Linux tries, wants to be a simple, fast-moving operating system, it does have this three-level um, virtual address translation. So the global, the purpose of the global one is to globalize all of the processes that are currently running into one table. And then the idea, of, you might think, well, why don't we have the, the global table point to the one page table for the entire process? But this middle layer gives Linux the ability to say, to, to do kind of what we were saying is segmentation. Cut your program up into sections, and then the sections could be managed individually. OK, so that's uh, virtual address translation. Uh, the real memory, this kind of changes over time because Linux is kind of a, an evolving because one or two companies that have a consortium with people improving the operating system. But um, we have the DMA, this is kind of for legacy reasons. So DMA, well that was on our, on our midterm, right? What is DMA? So that would be instead of us having to have to go through the processor to access memory and then copy it over, we could have hardware that reads and writes pages directly into a certain section of our memory for very, very fast uh, input-output from the disk drive. And then we have what's a, what we'll call our normal zone. So that's uh, user and most of the kernel data. So the kernel, the processes running in this memory could be like the operating system functions. And as more processes are added to our system, more process control blocks are needed and therefore more pointers. So what would be considered the operating systems, um, stack and heap storage could grow and shrink in this area. Linux allows some of this space to be given to user programs, but it is predominantly for the operating systems programs. And then the higher ones are more user with some uh, kernel space if needed. So if it turned out the process, the, the, the operating system was running and happened to use up all of its uh, space, it could go into the user space and eat up some storage there. Won't just say uh, the operating system has run out of room. So. so the users can borrow the operating system storage and the operating system can borrow the user storage. Okay, so then different ways of managing um, blocks of storage. So we, we talked about in this class, we talked about how if you needed to get a, 
if you needed to bring in a new page of storage from the disk drive, we had to pick something and kick it out. What would, what are two, two different ways we could figure out where to go to get it from? Should we keep an inventory of all the pages that are currently in use? Or we could, we could look at all the pages that are currently free. And would one, would one be better than the other? Would you want to keep an inventory of what's in use and then avoid those? Or would you want to keep an inventory of what's free and pick one of those? And could you almost argue that uh, either method is equally as complicated as the other? I mean, the bottom line is, how would, if you were designing an operating system, what would you do? Would you keep track of what's in use or would you keep track of what is free? And what, what's the gain of the drawback of? And if, you, if you're keeping an inventory of what's free, then every time you use something, you have to mark it, you have to take it out of your inventory. And if you're keeping a, what's in use, then any time you want to go to figure out what's free, you'd have to look at all the stuff that's in use and take something that's not in that list. So it ends up being probably, it, it's, probably it's, it's really a choice. It's not, not one is better than the other. But um, Linux wants to keep a collection of pointers to pages that are free. And what they like to do, instead of just saying, like, here's an inventory of everything that's free, you might need two pages together or four pages together or eight pages together. So what they decided to do was they have a collection of pointers. And then from that collection of pointers, it points to a linked list. So the linked list goes on and on. And then those linked lists have pointers to free pieces of storage. So if, if you needed one page frame, and that's all, something's, you're bringing something in from the disk drive and it only needs one page frame, you would go to the pointer that has a linked list of individual free pages. So you go to the first one, and the first one says, here's a free page frame. If you don't want to use that one, you would go to the next one. Actually, you wouldn't use the first one. And then this one would get taken off the list, and this would become the front of the list. So this is a linked list of all the page frames that are standalone. They're single. They're not two contiguous ones. If you needed two contiguous ones, you could go to the next pointer, which then points to a linked list of pieces of storage that have exactly two free frames together. And if you wanted four free frames together, you could go to the third pointer, which then has a linked list that points to all the frames all the blocks of four pages together. So the operating system manages, Linux manages in powers of two blocks of storage that are available. So if you needed, um, if you, so if you needed five page frames for some reason, you're going to end up being given eight. They're not going to give you five and then save three for later because there's no way three would fit on here. But they could give you five and then give two to this linked list and one to another linked list. So anytime you go needing a chunk of storage, a chunk of storage whether it's contiguous or not, however many frames you need in a row, you'll go to the pointer that matches the power of two. Whatever, whatever page size you need, whatever the power of two is just above that, you'll go to that pointer and then go down and be given that block of storage for it. So it tr it's always trying to give you contiguous storage for what it is you're bringing into the system, even though you may not need or is this going to find it for you? And generally, it is better to have these storage near each other if you can't do that. Okay, so the page replacement system. This is where um, Linux try, tries as, as best as it can to use the least recently used uh, page replacement algorithm. So page replacement... Um, Page replacement is the topic of when a new page needs to come in, we already have pages in the system, we have to kick somebody out. So just a little review of what we talked about in the class. If you can see into the future, that's considered the optimal method. If you know what the future holds, you kick out the page that's going to be le used least into the future. But a lot of times we can't see into the future. So now what we're trying to do is predict the future from the past. So a very popular algorithm, but very time consuming, is the least recently used. So you look at the past and you say, well, out of all the pages in memory, whichever one was used least recently, we'll kick that one out, because the guess is, well, it hasn't been used in a while, it probably won't be used 
in the near future. So the downside, do you remember what the downside to the least recently used algorithm was? It's, it's pretty good for a way of looking at the past to predict the future, but the, it's time consuming. So yeah, so the idea is that it's time consuming. Every time you touch a page, you have to move it to the front of the queue. So Linux manages two queues. Um, they have what they call the active list, and then they have of all the pages in memory that are called the inactive list. So the idea kind of goes like this. As pages are used, now it's, it doesn't work exactly like least, least, least recently used, that every time a page is touched, it moves to the front of the queue. That's the thing we said would be very expensive. But what we're doing is, as pages are being used, they get migrated to the front of the active queue. And then that ends up being whatever is whatever is not migrating to the front of the active queue, which is kind of the tail of the active queue, a thread will come by and start moving them slowly to what we're calling the inactive queue. And the tail of the active queue gets moved to the head of the inactive queue, so it will take a while to get down to the bottom. When you eventually get down to what they call the inactive queue, the tail of that could migrate off to disk. So the process of migrating the tail of the inactive queue to disk is done by a low priority thread that's just move, try, trying to keep the system clean. So any, any comment about this? I remember the first time I saw this, as, there was something I thought was strange. But any, anything you thought, when you're thinking about what we're saying of, of having some kind of a queue to say, these are the very, very active ones, these are the very inactive ones. Yeah. So it says new page is loaded from the right to the inactive queue? Yeah, so that's one thing strange, that when a new page comes in, it moves to the head of the inactive queue. Um, so yeah, it's, it's brought into the system at, at the inactive queue, and then as it gets used, what the system does is as it starts getting used, they get migrated to the active queue. So that's kind of a, uh, the page is coming in for the first time. We don't know if it's going to be like a big heavy hitting queue. Uh, I'm sorry, a heavy hitting page. So it kind of has to earn its way up to the top. Because maybe it's being brought in for one little task and we're not going to use it again. So we don't push it up to the top until it starts being used. But the other thing I thought was strange is why have two queues? If we put this together, isn't this really just like one big queue? This is very active. This is very inactive. And why do we kind of have a line that says, well, these are the active ones. These are the inactive ones. Does that kind of like? The, I don't know if that question popped up when you're seeing this for the first time. Why do we have two queues when it's really one big queue? Um, but that gives Linux the opportunity. What it's basically doing is it's using bits on the page to kind of keep account of how many times it's been referenced. And if the count hits a certain number, then they get migrated to the top. And the bits on the inactive ones don't have to be managed. So we're not trying to figure out what should get migrated up to the top. What we're doing is just putting pages into the inactive list, and then if they get moved, if they get um, referenced, then they get moved up to the active list. So it's not a full-blown, least recently used, like every time a page gets touched, it moves to the head of the queue. But when a page gets touched, we're, we're manipulating the bits, the reference bits, and maybe there's two or three bits for referencing. We'll increase the count, and then every once in a while, a thread comes through looking at those bits, and migrates the ones that have been used to the top. So we don't have the enormous cost of the least recently used, that every time a page gets touched, this queue has to be manipulated. But we do have the effect of when pages get hit somewhat often, they will migrate to the top of the list. So again, every operating system would love to use, if they can't predict, if they can't see into the future, they would love to use the idea of least recently used, but it's very time consuming. So they're always looking for some way to simulate it. And what they're doing here is they're just, you know, like I said, we're, we're, we have an active list. And then pages that are in the active list, those bits are being manipulated when, they're being, uh, when the pages are being touched. So you can think of it like, let's just say, for example, we have three bits for every page. Well, with three bits, we can count from 0 to 7. So when the page gets put in here, it gets a score of 0. The page gets referenced, it becomes 1. Reference again, it becomes 2. And then we can just run through here and we can say, well, anything that's a count of five or higher gets migrated to the top. Yeah? So I'm guessing the, uh, the active list is a lot smaller than the inactive list? 
I, that's a good point. Like, what would make you say that? That, that, that would be nice if that were true. Yeah, because you're going to have to be recalculating the reference bits a whole lot. Well, see, if, if you could do that in hardware, so if we have like a full adder, you take like three bits and you add one to it. So, so to touch a page and then have a piece of hardware change a three to a four would not consume any time besides the time of referencing it. So if moving, moving elements around in a cube will consume time. But we would like this to, I'm not even sure it needs to be small if these are hardware bits that come with the page. Yeah, you don't know it's going to be hardware. Yeah, so the, if, if it was not, if, if the um, computer architecture we're running the Linux system on didn't provide the hardware bits, then this would start to become software, which would then be time consuming. Like every instruction has a corresponding uh, updating instruction. And then in that case, the active list, you would want to keep it very small. So it's kind of the question you ask, like, like I say, every operating system question, there is no right or wrong answer. It's like, well, under this circumstance, this way is better. So if, it, if the hardware didn't have those bits where we could just somehow change the bits with having no cost to doing it and then every once in a while have a thread come through and reshape this cube, then that would be a, a very, pretty close approximation of least reasonable use without taking up a lot of time. And then the idea of this, this dividing line between active and inactive allows us to put stuff in the inactive list and not really care about it because nobody's touching it. So we can have maybe one bit that just gets turned on if it gets used and then every once in a while we promote inactive items into the active list. So again, it's, it's every, they're always trying to simulate um, least recently used and do it in a way that doesn't consume a lot of time. That's always the goal of the page replacement algorithm of any operating system. Um, so then the, uh, the uh, file system uh, ends up being in this, if you've used Linux, you're used to this. You have a home or root directory, and then we have the users under the root directory. Under those, we could have folders or even um, files under those. Um, so Linux, and kind of inherited this from Unix, uses um, an inode, which is, uh, inode is an index node, and a directory entry, which is sometimes referred to as a entry. Um, so if you wanted to find a file, let's say you had a foo.txt, you could look in the directory entry, and if it happens to be in the directory you're at at the moment, the directory entry would have a pointer to the inode cache, and the inode cache would give you the location on the disk drive, wherever the file is that you're looking for is. So in this case, the uh, directory entry and the inode pr 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 are present in the cache. And then in this example, the bar that PXT. Uh, we went to the directory entry, and then we also had an element in the inode, which was pointing to the file on disk. So in this case, it's saying the directory entry was not available, so we had no choice but to use the inode to find it. And just one, one side thing with um, uh, the file system of Linux, or Linux-based systems, is everything on the system is considered a file. So even the, the directory is a collection of pointers to files, or, or pointers to other directories, and even that's a that's a, a, a file also. And everything attached to your system is considered a file. You attach a printer to your uh, uh, system, it, the printer is considered a, a file. So here's a, here's a kind of an interesting and even debatable um, topic on uh, Unix. But just if it, from, a, from a point of view of a design, if you wanted to see, this is now the inode, the index node for a particular file. So when you eventually go to, to access a file, there's a chunk of storage which has metadata, data about the file. So we have like permission information, we have timestamps, when was it created, when was it last modified, uh, who the owner is. And now we get to the point where we want to know the actual content of the file. 
So if you were going to design a system, just off the top of your head, if you wanted to keep track of when the file was created, who's the owner, when it was last modified, and now here's the storage, would you put, would you group all that information together in one big block, or would, what, is there a downside to doing that? Well, I guess, so the, the downside could be files of different sizes, and if we wanted to have like a directory, a directory with 50 files in it, it might be a good idea to have one block that just says like the name and the, you know, the kind of stuff you see when you list out the directory. It would be nice if that was all in like fixed size blocks. And then the actual file itself, which could be variable in size, we could have a pointer in those blocks to those files. This would make us like look in a, we could look in a directory and say list, like the, what's the command, ls, base, whatever the, whatever that is. Those commands could run very, very quickly if we put a block of storage with just that information and then maybe a pointer in that block that says, and now here's where the actual file stuff is. So again, there's never a right answer in an operating system, but what Linux decided to do was have an index, a chunk of storage, all the same exact size, so it's very easy for the processor to read them all and spit out the data. And then if you wanted to actually go see the content of the file, you'd have to you know, issue another command that says, now let me see the file. So suppose, so that's what they decided to do. They have, you know, a fixed size for permission, fixed size for timestamps, fixed size for owner information. And now they have a, a fixed size that says, here's where the data is. Now, if you were to do that, if you were to decide, would you have just one pointer to the whole um, file? Or would you have a number of pointers, like would you say, the file could be in as much as 10 different pieces, so why don't I put all 10 of them here? See, the, the issue you run into, if you had one pointer to where the data is, the data could be scattered all over the disk. Now you have to read the first part to get to where the second part is, and then the third part, that could take a long time. So would you, again, this is a design issue, there's no right answer, but would you uh, have 10 pointers? So that allows you to have 10 different, parts, so maybe if you need the eighth part, you can just go right to the eighth pointer and grab that part. But why 10? Why not 50? Or Whatever number you pick, you're now, you're now making every file take exactly that much space, and maybe many files don't need that. So off the top of your head, if you were designing a, uh, a system like this, anything you choose? Yeah? Okay, so have you have you seen the? I mean, that's interesting that you came up with that. So, like I, I, when I first thought about this, I think maybe yeah, let's pick some number like four pointers: the first quarter, the second quarter, the third quarter, and the fourth quarter. If it's a really small file, cut it up into little pieces and have the pointers each point at a quarter. If it's really huge, then each pointer points at a big chunk. But then what if it got really, really huge, the chunks itself would get big and it might be nicer to break those down into smaller sets. But now we don't want this thing so big. We don't want to make a thousand pointers for something of small that's a file that's very small. So it kind of got into this trade-off question of we want to allocate a certain number of pointers, but not too many, but not too few. If the file is really small, let's not have a lot of pointers, and if the file's really large, I'd like to be able to have tons and tons of pointers, but we only have a small fixed space. So what they decided to do was to let the first, and it seems to change now, maybe the first 12 pointers point to the first 12 small blocks of the file. The 13th pointer will point to a collection of pointers, maybe 12 pointers that point to 12 different blocks. So the first 12 blocks are pointed to directly by the inode. The 13th pointer points to 12 more pointers, which each point to 12 blocks. So this could be like another 144 blocks. Then the double indirect pointer, this pointer points to a block that, of pointers that points to a block of pointers. So now it could be, if you're using a radix like 12, then it would be 12 times 12 times 12 pages. And then the last one would be like 12 times 12 times 12. That would be like if the file got really huge. So it has the advantage of everything being fixed in length. 
And for very small files, we have like maybe 10 or 12 pointers to the, the file itself. If the file got, re if it got somewhat big or really big or super big, we can handle it. But this gives us the opportunity to have the inode be a very small chunk of storage so we could issue commands like list out everything in the directory and read these blocks very quickly. And then if the file was small, we can get to all its blocks very quickly. And if they get big, we have the capacity to have, you know, exponentially many uh, pointers to the file, to the blocks of the file. So again, there is no right or wrong answer, but accessing big files on Linux will take a lot of time because you have to go through these three levels of pointers just to get to the storage. As opposed to other operating systems that might make the inode or whatever they consider comparable to the inode uh, much, much bigger, but then that ends up taking a lot of space if your system has a lot of small files. And Unix, and especially the Linux version of Unix, was kind of geared towards having a lot of files that are not so big. So it's like a small, it's kind of meant for a small company or maybe even an individual person doing software development. So it wasn't really meant for tremendously large files, but we still have the pointer system there for it to happen. So the three level one points to a collection of pointers, which points to one set of pointers, which points to another set of pointers, which eventually points to blocks in your storage on disk.